introduce you, but have a nice question and answer with them. We're going to kind of have a town hall format today. And the, the nice part about that is we like to get questions from our viewers out there. We really want you to participate today. So feel free to ask questions in here and, and you can type them in and we'll try to do our best to get to those, okay? We received some questions from other social channels in advance and we'll be answering some of those kind of throughout the process and throughout the next 20, 25 minutes for you. But our goal today is to just have a fun conversation about golf, business, and Betnardi. But before I introduce Bob and Sam Betnardi, I just want to tell you a couple things I love about Betnardi as a whole. And if you look right here, these two guys, number one for them, it's a family owned company. But look at Bob and Sam sitting right next to each other. Father, son, that's really, really cool. They've never raised any money from private equity, uh, never raised any money from any VCs, and just a, just a great little family owned company. So I really admire that. Not many small businesses can say that anymore in the golf industry. Two, the putters are manufactured, made, and milled right here in the United States. So just, just south of Chicago and Tinley Park. It's a suburb just south of uh, Chicago, a great little area. And that, that's really nice to see as well. That's very rare in today's day and age as well. I think last, and this is more for you, Bob, but you know, somehow, some way, you've always found a way to win. And I just really admire that about you as a whole. Like whether you're negotiating with me, you seem to always win. Hey. <laughs> Whether it's on the golf course, uh, you made it through the financial crisis in a good spot, various up and downs in the golf industry, and you've just have done a good job navigating that way. Now COVID-19, and I know you, you guys will find a way to win through that. So I just really admire all those things about you, Bob. Thanks for uh, kind of leading and leading the way for small businesses out there. But with that said, I just want to say, hey, thanks for joining us and uh, welcome, guys. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it. And it's a beautiful day today in Chicago. It's like 75 and sunny. So we're getting coming up on May 1st, which is uh, Illinois is going to uh, open the golf courses on May 1st, which is this Friday. And uh, there's 653 golf courses in the state. So we're all looking forward to, to having that happen. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we got a little rain here in Minnesota today, but we did get open. We got open last Friday, and there's been a lot of good excitement around golf, and that's some good news, too. So, Illinois, you're looking at on Friday for sure. Is that going to happen? Well, May 1st, which is Friday. Yeah, this is uh, this is happening. So, I know I just got an email from uh, one of my courses, and it said that uh, you could call in and schedule tee times. Very cool. That's a beautiful thing. Sam, do you have a tee time made up yet? I do. I'm looking to finally get out Friday afternoon, you know, not being able to play is uh, is tough. But obviously, this is a difficult situation we're in with uh, the amount of people that are infected and the people that have actually died from uh, this virus. But because golf is an outdoor sport and you are social distancing when you are outside, I think it's a great move to let people out of the house, get some exercise, fresh air and and start enjoying the uh, the outdoors again. So I think it's a great move for Illinois. So maybe just give us a little update about Ben Nardi. What have you been up to the last month or so? And, and like, how are you dealing with the current situation as a whole? Yeah, the last the last month, Simon, it's been it's been a little bit challenging for us, but I think we've been able to to weather this uh, storm, so to speak, fairly well. Uh, we've been able to keep a, uh, a minimal staff here to run our uh, our e-commerce business, including the Hive and uh, all of our production inline product. Um, you know, we're not milling any new putters at, right now, which does uh, does hurt us, but we're able to get through and continue to provide uh, our customers and fans the best products in golf. So it's difficult for everybody, but we feel like we've weathered it fairly well. When you think manufacturing will be back up and running and shipments and kind of back to full capacity, what are your, what are your guys' thoughts there? We're following the state of Illinois' guidelines on that, Simon. So we're hoping by the, by the end of May, it sounds like May 26 or May 28, uh, we'll be able to start ramping up again. But again, right now we have a, a very baseline operation to keep things going for uh, for not only the uh, the American customers, but also a lot of the customers that we have around the globe that are easing restrictions in their certain countries like South Korea, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand. They've actually had almost no new cases now. So we're not just a company that sells in the Midwest and the U.S. We have a global distribution where we're trying to take care of them as well. Are you seeing sales and kind of just general demand in Asia start to pick up a little bit over the last several weeks? And you we think that's a precursor to what's going to happen in the U.S.? Yeah, as as I think Korea and China are coming back online uh, more recently, you're starting to see Japan dip down a little bit. They're trying to figure things out. 
Taiwan's done very well with this. You know, some other Asian territories like Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, they've been hit a little bit harder. So we're just working very closely with all of our partners and and hoping for the best and that this thing passes. Yeah, really good. Hey, I know, you know, we have some questions kind of piling up here and coming in, but I do have one for you guys here, just kind of for myself, but your family owned business, right? Family owned, small business. And there's really not many out there, right? I mean, there's not many family owned businesses in the golf industry. And then there's not many, you know, family owned small businesses in the industry. You're maybe one of just a couple in general that are more kind of in that medium size range, if you would. But just like, what are the challenges? Maybe talk to the listeners and viewers out there, but what are the challenges of being a family owned business as a whole? Yeah. And then, you know, what are some of the rewards that go along with that as well? Yeah. Yeah, I could talk a little bit about that. Um, the great thing uh, for us is uh, Sammy is 30 years old and he has a, actually a, a little baby now, two year old baby, Matteo Betnardi. So I have a grandchild, it's my first one. Actually, Sammy's Congrats. got. And so I got two grandkids, but we have a legacy now, which is really cool, Simon. And, uh, and, and it's really nice to know. So with that being said, if this is 2020 and he's two years old, I would think we got another 70 or 80 years left at least of veterinary <laughs> golf. So I think that's good for the golf industry. I think it's good for the individuals who like really solid uh, of golf products. And that's what we make here. And, uh, you know, one of the things I do want to say is, is we've got around $20 million worth of CNC milling equipment here. And we were able to secure a part that we're doing for the ventilators for take offline the putters. And we're actually doing a part for the ventilators for a company called GE, which is General Electric, they make these high-end ventilators. And my whole staff, and we got a, we got a large mm -hmm. staff, my whole staff is very excited about that. The fact that we're doing something for this uh, virus, something for this uh, this health crisis that we're in. So that's kind of cool for us. And so, that, so now we are really, uh, we're an essential business. And uh, so we feel very good about that, hopefully, that we don't need all those ventilators. Hopefully we don't need all the, the stuff that the governments, uh, the states and the federal government are trying to provide. But with all that being said, going back to the family business, uh, Sam graduated seven years ago from uh, from his uh, college and then he came in the workforce and, and the business has grown, Simon, as you know, about 20 to 25% a year for the last six to seven years. And it's been a oh. great run. This is just a little hiccup. Like you said, we're going to get through this. I have no doubt in my mind that the pent up demand for going out for dinners, going to movies, uh, playing golf, buying golf equipment, you know, whatever it may be, going outside, just being outside, fishing, whatever it may be, people are going to want to do everything. There's going to be a huge pent up demand. We're ready for it. We're excited about it. Uh, we can't wait until things start to break. I'm sure you feel the same way. I know you've got some of your stores are closed right now and you can't wait for that to reopen. And I think if you ask every golf manufacturer in the industry, they're chopping at the bit to get back to normal. And and, and I think it's not even going to be normal. I think it's going to be, you're, everybody's going to experience at least a 10 to 25% increase in their sales for, for the next year, if not the next couple of years to come. I think that's what's going to happen, which is going to be awesome for us. Uh, nobody's been able to play golf. Maybe your golf course is going to look a lot better. It's going to look like Augusta National uh, out there, but so be it. Uh, but let's get through it. And uh, yeah, with all that being said, we're, we're excited about what we have at Betnardi Golf going forward. We have a great uh, situation happening with Sam being a young man, and he has a son now. So it's a great question, Simon, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, and I think along that line, Sam, for you, you came along in the business about five years ago, right? Kind of got introduced and you've been working at the business much earlier than that in life as well. But how's it been for you? How's it been kind of getting assimilated, getting introducing yourself to the industry and just kind of helping take over on the putting side of the world? Yeah, so I started here uh, 2013. So I think this is my eighth year, Simon. Um, and I just try to learn as much as I can from uh, this guy sitting right next to me. You know where we're talking to you at is in my in Bob's office, um, 
And when I started out of college, this was essentially my office, and I just wanted to learn as much as I can from my dad. He's been making putters since 1992, 1993. So just from the, the aesthetics of what a putter should look like, what a one-piece milled putter should look like, all the little nuances from, you know, the radiuses on the bumpers, the top lines, the neck, you know, the shoulders, the different feels that we offer with our face millings, that's been a big learning curve. And I've just tried to dive right in and, and uh, soak up as much as I can. And then, you know, the different parts of Betnardi Golf, working with tour players like Matt Kuchar, Fred Couples, uh, you know, our, our great run in 2018 when in the British Open with Molinari. So just having a lot of feedback and direct interaction and communication with some of those guys has been really awesome. And then other parts of the business, sales, you know, growing our distribution, uh, you know, our, our e-commerce business, you know, online. So it's been a full faceted approach to learn as much as I can. But uh, my dad's had all the experience in the world doing this for the last, you know, nearly 30 years. So it's been a lot of fun. Hey, Simon, if you don't mind, I'd like to add one thing. Yeah. Every now and then I, I'll i see on Instagram or I'll see online that there's another uh, guy that's making putters and so on. And uh, I, I, I sometimes look at the comments and they're trying to figure out who came up with the one piece technology. And if you remember, the first time you and I met was back in the 90s. At the Las, at the Vegas. Las Vegas Golf Show, right? It was at the Las Vegas Golf Show. There's all apparel. Now you and I were there. You and I were there. You were you were hawking your stuff, and I was hawking my stuff, and it was a great story. But I remember I was trying to tell you back then, and I, I know you were listening about how we created the one piece technology of in at that time when I got into the business in 1991, I was making product for a lot of different companies, and everybody was milling. I don't know if you could see this. This is this is just a, a regular uh, BB1 style putter. But everybody yeah. was milling this hosel onto the body of the putter. And it, it's, a, it's a crazy story. But the guy that I was outsourcing to have him do the welding for me was every other month he would raise his price. And then he would also say, well, you know, I promised you two weeks. I can't give you the putters and for six weeks. So it kept it kept you know irritating me, and you know how they say when well, you have an irritation, a lot of times you'll you'll come up with a better way or a better mousetrap. So what I decided to do was take this putter right here, and I decided to uh, make this whole block this whole putter out of a block of metal, a solid block, instead of welding the hosel on there. And when I presented it to uh, a couple of the OEMs I was working for, they were completely amazed. And they said, well, my gosh, that's going to be very expensive. And and how did you even do that? And so that was kind of the Bob Bettinardi, Bettinardi, um, uh, I would say the addition or the uh, design uh, thing into the golf industry. And I feel very, very proud about that. I just feel like that one piece technology. Now, every golf company that makes mill putters, is using that technology, but we were the first ones to ever come up with that. And in 1993, we had a guy, Bernhard Langer, who won a putter that was made in my shop with the first one piece mill putter. And he won the Masters tournament, uh, Augusta National. And it was just it was just a cool thing for me to see something like that and see how somebody could win the actually the best tournament of the year always, right? Augusta National. And see that happen like that. And it was just a uh it was almost kind of like a little notch in my so-called belt, and yeah. it was a little cool thing. But but now we nobody even thinks about the one piece. Everybody's hey, we're gonna make it one piece, one piece. The only time we weld the hosel onto the body of the putter is if somebody requests it, like if it's a custom putter, and they want to see the weld to make it more look like very cool. Okay, and it's a very cool factor now to have a welded putter, where before it was the only way that people did that and i remember I think, how many yeah I think, I think the one thing that really yeah that jumps out to me too bob and sam when i come to down to tinley park and i've been there probably i don't know six seven times but every time i visit you go in and then the last time i was there there's a new machine being delivered and you were saying those machines are over a million dollars each right the big cnc million machine but it's just impressive to see the actual manufacturing of one of the putters that that billet you showed there 
And then all of a sudden, 90 minutes later, it comes out and it looks maybe like that one you had there. I don't know if that was a BB1 or yep. what you had there. Right. But Actually, it's the uh, BB0 tribe. One of the things we yeah. want to show to everybody paying attention today is this is a brand new prototype <laughs> we've actually never made before. It's a BB0 triplane. So everybody's familiar with our BB8 triplane and a very famous golfer using a similar style to this. But this is the first time ever we've made a Trisol BB0. So uh, when the tour gets really cool. and everything starts out, we're excited to bring this model to tour and get some feedback. We'll see if we can get a prototype from you. We'll talk about that later on, all right? Yeah. All right, hey, here's a question. Here's a good segue from Ron here. Ron's got a great question. He has a BB32 right now. He's looking to replace it with a newer model. What would you recommend? I would say to Ron, uh, a BB32 is a, a plumber's neck mallet. That was from our, I think, 2013, 2014 BB series. So the most similar to that would be our Queen B10. That's a, a very beautiful rounded mallet. It's got a crescent neck. So it has almost the identical toe hang and it still features that honeycomb face milling. So to Ron, I'd say definitely check out the Queen B10. Sam, when you guys are building putters, you can talk loft, fly, length. You're looking 34, you know, typically 34, 35 inches from a from a length standpoint. Tell me about the weight of the head. I know lie usually is around 71, loft around 3.5, or is it 4.0? Yeah, for us, all of our lie and loft is 70 and 3, minus the innovates. We have two degrees of loft on the innovate heads, and then our arm locks, of course, have five degrees of loft because you have so much forward press. Uh, as far as the lie, we're at 70, and when we fit people here at Studio B, we find we often go more flat for golfers. Their hands are a little bit uh, lower. So we'll fit a lot of people at 67 to 69 range. Um, and then length, again, length is very personal. You, there's really no one size fits all length. That's why I always recommend it, people to always go get fit. Bob, for you, who's the toughest you've ever fit or made a putter for on tour? Hmm. Well, I'll, say that the, I'll tell you the easiest guy was Jasper Parnovic. When, I, when we won our first tournament in 99, it was about 5.30 on a Wednesday night. The tournament was starting the next day. And I was packing my bag to go to the airport. And he looks at me and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. Where are you going? I go, I'm going to the airport. He goes, can I try this putter? I go, yeah. And he goes, hits four putts with it. And he goes, I'm going to use this putter. I go, well, do you want me to change your grip, the loft, the lie, the language, anything? He goes, no, I like it. And he ends up shooting 27 under par, and he wins the tournament with it. That was the fastest guy. The slowest guy, <laughs> probably Nick Faldo, okay? I'm not going to say anybody. There might be a few guys that I don't want to mention their names. Nick Faldo wouldn't mind mentioning it. It took me two years with Nick Faldo. And if you ask anybody that has, was on a trailer at the PGA Tour events, that new Nick Faldo, they'll say the same thing. The guy was ridiculous. Okay, everything had to be perfect. Everything had to look right. I mean, if you, God forbid, there was a little, you did all that work and there was a little scratch on something, he would say, nope, I don't want it. He was very particular, but hey, the guy won the, he won his fair share of events and he's uh, he was a great, great golfer for many, many years. So yeah, I, guess, really I mean, everybody's different, Simon. Fun stuff. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, Matt Kuchar designing the arm lock and how that played out and just what, are the, what were the challenges with that? What was fun about that in general? I'll tell you the backstory. I'll let Sammy tell you the design story. The backstory is uh, I'm trying to figure out what year it was. It was maybe 2010 was the PGA Championship in Kohler. And I'm trying to think that was the year, but I was there. And uh, was it 10? Was it 2010 or 11? 10 or 11 in, in, in Kohler, Wisconsin. And he was sitting down eating lunch, and I had my badge on, so I was able to kind of maneuver around where the players were. And I started talking to him about making him a putter. And the first thing he said out of his mouth, he said, if you could make me a putter that I could make one or two more putts per round, I don't care uh, about – any money that you would ever pay me to be on your staff or anything. I just want a putter that I could make putts with. And he looked, he looked like he was exasperated when he said that, like, like he's probably been through you know, 5,000 putters in the last two months. 
just the way he was talking to me. And I had such a huge opening right there and then when he said that. And I says, well, Matt, of course I can make you a putter that's going to make you one or two more putts per round. You're going to have to let me go back to my facility and do that for you. I got a pencil. I got a pad of paper. Let's talk. We spent about maybe 45 minutes with him talking and going over everything that he wanted, everything he looked at. Going to the arm lock, was, that was right then and there was his suggestion to do that. How long should the shaft be? How much of an offset should it be? How much loft should be in the putter? All that was crazy stuff. It was like Frankenstein stuff, okay? And uh, when we got back, we started doing them, and it took – so maybe I'll take the Nick Faldo comment back. Maybe it was Matt Kuchar. Going back over and over again, sending him a putter, sending him two putters, getting them back, getting calls from him, getting texts from him. All day long, all the stuff that was happening with Matt Kuchar – Finally, we got a putter in play. Do you remember what tournament? I can't remember what tournament was. It was in the. I think what it was, was the he? Shark Shootout in Naples, uh, November of 2012. Yeah. Started using it then, and then November, December, a little bit of an off season. Come January, in Hawaii. Uh, in Hawaii, he was still using it, and then he won the WGC uh, in February at Dove Mountain out in Arizona, and that's when we knew we had something because. Uh, to go out and put a putter in play in November, really only probably four or five tournaments from November till February, and he wins, and we knew it. And then in May, he won the Memorial. And then since basically the Memorial on, uh, 2013 till now, he's been on Bettinardi's staff. He's won, I believe, five or six times, one of the best uh, money leaders out there uh, on the PGA Tour during that time, and he's Mr. Consistent. So that arm lock style really works. I think you know, that new the new season for him, the majors is going to play out well because he likes playing a lot of tournaments in a row. So I think yeah. this fall could be his time there. I do. It's kind of interesting. I look at his putter when I watch TV and you see him live or watching TV, but that toe looks like it's maybe one and a half to two degrees up in the air. Maybe <laughs> something to look into, guys. Maybe it, what's that? 70 degrees right now? 71, 72? Uh, he's at 70 with, he used to be at seven or eight degrees aloft. Now he's at two and a half degrees aloft, believe it or not. And yeah, I, and the line, I think that throws just a hair in the air, maybe a degree or two upright. But maybe like that, I'm sure he knows exactly what he's doing. How about if you talk about couples for a second? Oh, go ahead, Sam. I was just going to show this. As my dad's talking about Frankenstein putters, this was one of the first prototypes we made for Matt. You can see the welded slant neck on that putter, and it probably has three shafts of offset uh, You know, on yeah. this future model too. So just the evolution of design and all the models that we made them. And now he's pretty much steady uh, using the same putter week in and week out. But to get Matt into the product was a very uh, trying process. Congratulations. Cool stuff. Maybe look at that lie. May need, may need to go down one or two degrees of, of lie on that, on that putter. We'll see what happens. So from a uh, couple of couples, talk about Freddie. Obviously two kind of different players. Just a little bit about Freddie. What's it like working with Freddie? Well, Freddie, I was with uh, – actually, it was at uh, – November. November of this year, we contacted him and said, hey, listen, I'm going to be down in Naples, and you're coming to play the uh, the event down there on the channel. And he said that he would like to meet me down there. We're going to do a little film with him. So we spent about three hours, and Fred Couples, and everybody knows this, but he is, he is like a, a brand-new set of silk sheets, okay? He's about as smooth as they get, Simon. He's Smoother than you as well, too. Main. What's that? Smoother than you as well? Uh, he is. He is. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. But he he is really a nice guy, okay? He doesn't he, – he may not come off like that sometimes because there's people who, you know, they want everything, right? They want a picture with him. They want his autograph with him. So, he's you know, he may come off a little bit like, hey, just leave me alone. I'm, I'm going to go play. But he is as nice as guy as you could ever be. Uh, we talked about a bunch of stuff in the video, uh, and he is uh, – we picked Freddie up about maybe seven or eight years ago, and it was a great story where he was in Chicago playing an event, a champions event, and, uh, you know, hey, i like to make you a putter, Freddie, and Freddie said no. And then I'm like, Freddie, you know, I would – come on, give me a chance. And he's like – all right, take my specs of my putter. Bring it to the trailer and get the specs. 
And then I, I come back and 20 minutes later and I go, okay, I got everything. I'm going to make this putter. He go, I go, what's your address? He goes, here's my uh, agent's cell phone. Call him. So I'm leaving and I'm thinking, I'm going to call the agent. I call the agent up. He tells me to send it to him. And I'm thinking, this putter will never get to Freddie Couples. It's going to go to the agent. He's going to play with it. Or he's going to give it to one of his best friends. About four or five weeks later, we make the putter. We give it to his agent. We send it to him. He calls me up two weeks later, and he says, Freddie is going to use your putter this week. And he ends up winning. And from there that day forward, that was about six years ago, we've had Freddie using our product. He's on our staff. He loves betting already. He loves the fact that we make everything in America. He's a big American-made guy. He loves that uh, that we are a family company. Uh, so he's, he's into all that, you know, and, uh, he's just a great guy. He's a, he's still an unbelievable player. I mean, that guy could play. So, uh, and, uh, he's a super guy to be able to bounce ideas off of. Hey, Freddie, I'm thinking about doing this. Uh, I'm thinking about doing that. What's your thoughts? Well, Hey, if you do this, uh, you gotta be careful of the, uh, you know, your, your, your loft, or you gotta be careful of you know, the angles of the soul so it doesn't skid when you go on your backswing, whatever it may be. He's he's helped us out with a lot of uh, designs and a lot of thought process, which is great because that's what the guys for a living you play golf. You and I got to work, Simon. This guy plays golf for a living. He knows the golf course. He knows what clubs he wants. He knows what works for him. So it's a beautiful thing. I tell you what, we'll take, you can get an order today. We'll take the first 20 of your 30 prototype Freddie Putter. How about that, Bob, right there? <laughs> yes or no? Should I number them or just no? Number them for sure. Yep. All right. Yep. All number right. them for sure. Maybe, maybe, I don't know what Masters you won. You won the 92 Masters, right? That was yes, like the 48 Masters or whatever it may have been. You can make 48 of them in honor yes. of that. We'll take the first 20. Actually, Deal? he told me a story about, remember, he almost put it in the water on 12. Yeah. I asked him, I says, what did you think when that ball left your club? And he said, I hit the ball a little uh, fat. And he said, as soon as I hit it, he goes, I, I know I hit it fat, and I still thought it was going to make the green. At the same time I hit it, I felt the wind come up. And he said, how the ball did not go in the water, I have no idea. But he would have won the tournament. I mean, he would, have, he would have took probably a five, right, for sure. Yeah. But he ended up having that little soft chip. He puts it four feet. He knocks it in for his par, and he goes on to win. So it, it was, it's got some great stories. Awesome. Hey, I got a question here from Mr. Matt Brown. So he asked on Facebook, how do you determine the size and style of the grip to use on your putters? Uh, I would, I could answer that one. As far as our, all the product that we make, you know, we rely on Lampkin grips as our, our uh, key supplier with all of our production inline grips. And I'd say one of the, the big developments for us that we were able to do in 2020 was our new sync fit grip, which is a jumbo style grip. It's a little bit softer, but the, the key determining factor on that is it's about 75 grams versus let's say the past five or six years we've been using Lampkin on jumbo size, they've been 130 grams. So that was a huge development process. So when we come up with grips, we're talking Lampkin, Bob Lampkin, uh, and his great team of engineers over there on what we hear from tour players, what my father and I like, and what we feel is best for the, the mass consumer. So, you know, you look at, you just mentioned Simon, Matt Kuchar, Fred Couples, they're arm lock guys. And both guys have been in and out of uh, longer uh, Lampkin, you know, 19-inch grips where you get a guy like a Molinari who's used a, uh, you know, just a standard deep edge cord. So, again, grips are very personal, just like putting is the most personal part of your game. But we're working on what we like and what our tour players like and then engineering those styles with Lampkin. Perfect. Thank you. Looks like Ben already partnered with Big League Chew on this promotion. I love Big League Chew. It's like one of my favorite bubble gums out there. Had in my pocket every time we played baseball back in the day. But just talk a little bit about that partnership and how's that working out? Uh, yeah, I would say that that was a, a, a limited release we did. I think it was like April 9th, uh, so earlier this month. 
Um, you know, my dad grew up playing baseball. He taught me the game of baseball. So I was always between baseball and golf as a, as a kid. And same thing as you, Sim. always had the big league chew in the back pocket. Uh, never really got into all the flavors like the grape, the sour apple and uh, sweet swing and strawberry. My parents kept it more of the original. I didn't want my teeth to rot out. Wait a minute, Sime. It was a home run. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Awesome. Bob, for you, what's in your bag? People want to know what's in your bag. What do you play in your bag? Maybe share the irons or driver, yeah. or, you know, maybe a putter, whatever you want to share with us. Yeah. Yeah. I got the 20, the Mizuno 20s. Love that iron. Oh, boy, I love that iron. Uh, I've got the Maverick driver, and I've got the TaylorMade – uh, I don't even know what is it. The, the newest Taylor made three wood, and uh, I've got a five hybrid and a four hybrid. Okay, so I'm not working. Hybrid. You can trade them in at second swing, just so you know. And I know you bought those from second swing, but when it's time to trade them in less, so how about you, Sam? What's in your bag? Uh, Ping G400 with the driver, the uh, the new Taylor made sim hybrid. Uh, I have a Taylor made M5 three wood, so a little bit of mixed bag up top, the 919 JPX Tour Mizunos. And then, of course, our, our new wedges, the HLX 3.0 chromes. Whoa. My dad's using the black smoke. And then as far as the putter goes, I still use the uh, the old trusty Windy City Wizard arm lock. So. And I've got the new Innovate 6 center shaft. Great Favorite putter of all time. Bob, Sam. Favorite putter of all time. Uh, actually, what I'm using right now, I'm making everything I look at. Oh. <laughs> That question came from Ross on via Facebook, so Good. it's an important question. How about you, Sam? Uh, I'd say right now in between the FCB and the three-step jam, I'd say the three-step jam right now, I just think looking down at it, it's it's gorgeous. And we had it in the in the in as a tour offering back in 2010 to 2012. And then actually I played a little bit of a part in, in kind of changing that head shape uh, with the bumpers, making it a lot rounder uh, versus a square blade. So... My dad gave me the design freedom on that one, so that was pretty cool. So right now it's a three-step. Wedges, and how, do that, how does the wedge you make in the HLX3, how does that compare to other wedges out there? What would you say the big differences are, and what do you like about them? I would say the big difference is that our HLX wedges are forged. So that's number one. So it's a feel story. Uh, you know, Forged products, forged irons, forged wedges are the, are the best feel out there. It's very consistent. And then for us, we also have our two finishes, chrome and black. Very versatile grinds on there. You have our C grind and RJ grind. And then new for us this year is we milled the grinds on the sole. So very consistent, very repeatable. Uh, they set up great. It's definitely a player's wedge. I wouldn't say it's extremely forgiving. It's still a very forgiving wedge. But it is more for, let's say, the, the better golfers uh, looking for a little bit more feel and touch. Um, so great product, and we launched, I would say, two weeks ago domestically. And as the stores open up, we can't wait for more people to start hitting them as demos. Really nice. Last thing for you guys here, and it's just around small businesses. We're a small business. You know, we have under 500 employees. We're around 200 employees. And, uh, you know, we like doing different things to support other small businesses in general as well. But how about you two, personally and company, anything you're doing to support other small businesses in the Illinois area? That you'd like to share with us? Uh, I would say, Sime, you know, I've been reaching out to a lot of the the buyers and the business owners in the golf industry, uh, you know, small business, you know, bigger business, and just asking them how we can work together. You know, for Second Swing uh, customers listening today, if you buy any production putter from Second Swing, we are offering a free hat. So if you do that today or tomorrow, so we're just trying to get creative on ways to keep keep the business going. Not only our business. But our retail partners, our wholesale part of our business is so huge for the company. We don't we don't want to see any anything bad happen, any of our partners. So any ways to get creative, whether it's marketing or giveaways, uh, we're, we're always here to support those guys. My wife and uh, daughter made the sign here. My daughter's been making these signs for businesses and selling them around town and just donating all the proceeds to small businesses. But she made that nice sign for you. Um, Mel in New York really nine years old. Send me an invoice for it, Simon. You can bill us. Right, there we go. Okay. I'll make sure to send it to you, not your dad. Well, hey, guys, I just want to say thank you so much. Thanks for all you do for the golf community. Thanks for all you do for small businesses, especially Second Swing. We really, really appreciate it. We're really grateful, and we're just very fortunate and feel blessed to have the partnership we do with you guys. So 
Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Good luck with everything, okay? Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it, buddy. Thanks, Talk guys. to you. Thank you. And thanks to all the viewers out there. We appreciate you tuning in today. Thank you.